Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we can now start because Ed Johnson has arrived. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to welcome you, um, especially those of you who are here for the alumni weekend. Um, as you probably know by now, this is Wilson's 50th anniversary year. And during that year, we have been doing various things to celebrate the fact that the college is half a century old. Um, one of the things we're doing is to have a set of anniversary lectures uh, in which we ask members of the college uh, to look back uh, over what's happened in their particular fields during the periods that the college has been in existence. We have one of these lectures a month and they're all recorded and are now available on the web, both in audio and video format. Uh, so if you're interested, go to the college website, follow the uh, 50th anniversary link, and you'll find the lecture so far. Now, because it's alumni weekend, and because it's a nice sunny afternoon, and because we're doing it in the afternoon, we thought it would be nice to change the format for once and have not a lecture, but a conversation. Uh, a conversation with someone who has played a central role in Wilson during its evolution from a bright idea by the university into the large successful college that you now see today. And of course that person is Gordon Johnson, who was our fourth president and is now an honorary fellow. Gordon was head of the college for 17 years, from 1993 to 2010. By background he's an historian of colonial India, but he's done a lot of other things as well. He's been, for example, among other things, director of the University Centre for South Asian Studies. He was the first provost of the Gates Cambridge Trust, which is our answer to the Rhodes Scholarships in Oxford, in the other place. He was for many years chairman of Cambridge University Press, and he's currently the president of the Royal Asiatic Society. He also knows more about, than most people I know about uh, academic politics. Um, and you know the story about academic politics, the, the, the joke which is why are academic politics so bitter and the answer is because the stakes are so low. <laughs> um, and, but Gordon's expertise is confirmed by the insightful commentary he, he produced on a famous book, Microcosmographica Academica by F.W. Cornford, which came out in 1908 and which was intended as a guide to academic politics for young academics. Um, and it is still quite relevant, we discover. Um, now, what Gordon and I will be talking about is what Cambridge was like when this college was founded. And we'll start, in a way, from the first line of L.P. Hartley's wonderful novel, The Go-Between. Uh, and the line reads, the past is another country, and they do things differently there. And that's true. Most people seeing Cambridge today have no idea how radically it has changed in the last half century. And in order to understand how Wolfson emerged from that Cambridge to surf the waves of change that then occurred, we need to go back in time. And that's hence the title of this conversation, Whence We Came. So Gordon, to start with, I think it would be a good idea briefly to sketch how the university evolved from, say, 1914 until the 1950s, because it, it was a very different place in the early years of the 20th century. Yes, of course, no institution that's lasted as long as, as Cambridge uh, has survived, really, from one generation to the next without seeing some major revolutionary change. But I think the changes that have taken place in Cambridge since the 1950s uh, outmatch in scale and in qualitative effect anything in the previous 750 odd, uh, 750 odd years. Although it is important to remember that uh, the 19th century was a period of massive change in Cambridge, uh, in Cambridge also. I think the the way that I've uh, I've been thinking about uh, uh, Cambridge in the in the 1950s. Uh, compared with now is, is very simply this. In the 1950s, Cambridge was still uh, a university 
and colleges, uh, whose uh, prime, indeed, main aim was the education of undergraduates for the BA degree. And it had uh, very roughly uh, three quarters of all the resource in the place, the colleges and the university combined, were devoted to the <coughs> undergraduate educational uh, mission in that rebarbative term. Um, it is true that since the late 19th century, at least, Cambridge had begun to uh, develop a research side. Uh, and of course, this was particularly noticeable um, in the sciences. Uh, and some of that research was extraordinarily uh, distinguished. So one is not, one is sort of mindful of all the uh, earth-shattering uh, discoveries that were made in the new Cavendish laboratory, for instance, uh, or, in, or in chemistry or in physiology uh, and in, in medicine uh, from the later 19th century. Uh, but if, if you follow the money, there's still only about a quarter of the university's research going into that research effort in the 1950s. Now, if you look at, uh, at, at 2010, 2015, where the resources are extraordinarily um, more huge than they've ever been uh, before, those proportions are reversed. So the undergraduate enterprise hasn't declined absolutely, but there's been a rebalancing within the university or within the university system, if one, can, uh, if one can call it that. And of course, the, the main things to the, the easy way of trying to capture uh, the changes since the 1950s are to remember that in the 1950s, the university and the colleges were all contained in the middle of the town. Um, that uh, the colleges were along the, uh, the east bank of the river, uh, that uh, the laboratories were on the uh, dining site and the new museum site, uh, that the university library was in where the old schools are, uh, that the university press had its uh, printing house uh, opposite Pembroke uh, College, um, that it was very much uh, integrated into the, into the town and the life of the town. Uh, it was the main employer. It was a very uh, service-oriented, labor-intensive uh, 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 setup. Um, the need for tobacconists, vintners, short sharpness, sharpness <laughs> cleaners, uh, bedders, cooks, chefs, all of those sorts of things made it, in a way, this uh, university uh, town where nowhere was more than 10 or 15 minutes walk or cycle ride. Um, it's true that already by the 1930s there were these outliers, of course there were the outcasts, you know, uh, Selwyn College and St Edmunds, the unsound uh, remaining religious houses exiled to uh, far distant places, uh, Newnham exiled to, uh, to Sidrick Avenue, which was a little bit off the beaten track in those days. Uh, Girton, of course, nearly at Huntingdon for, uh, <laughs> for sort of, uh, similar reasons. And uh, the Botanical Garden had moved into what had been wilderness uh, in, the 18, uh, in the 1840s and 50s. But it's interesting reading the Cambridge Review for the 1950s, where you get giveaway remarks like the, uh, the chemistry laboratories are really a little bit far out of town. These are the that's ones Lensfield on, on Road. Lensfield Road. Yes, that's Lensfield Road. And, and that, um, and that uh, when, the, uh, when the university library uh, was opened in the 1930s, um, uh, there were serious concerns as to whether anyone would find it and go to it because it would be so inconvenient to return to one's college for lunch from there. And the veterinary school, which Her Majesty opened in the middle 1950s, the joke was that you took the bus to Bedford to get to it. <laughs> so, so it was a very, uh, it was, in that sense, it was a very intimate uh, and different place. And 
the university, I, I mean, trying to understand um, the, uh, the constitutional and administrative structures of those days, it's, it's very hard uh, to convey now what it was really like because basically all the colleges are legal entities in themselves with their own endowments and technically uh, don't have to uh, take any notice of what anybody else says. The, the university is not even some sort of um, holding structure uh, really because it had no money uh, of, of its own. It had money that, that came from a, a congery of trust funds which explains why university professorships were paid at different rates because it depends, you know, if you were one professor in divinity you might have a nice living assigned to it and be paid a thousand pounds a year and another less than a hundred pounds a year. So uh, that was all very sort of chaotic uh, and uh, it was really held together by the fact that people conspired to hold it together. They saw mutual benefit in in operating together, but all the university did was to matriculate people for which it charged and then give them degrees for which it charged. And that was its only sort of free income really until you get to the 1920s when uh, through the mechanism of the University Grants Committee public money begins to flow into the university uh, and the university then has to devise ways of, of handling that. And again, one can, um, one can neatly sort of pin uh, uh, the sort of huge uh, administrative and constitutional changes that have taken place by saying that um, when John Neville Keynes retired as registrari in 1928, his office consisted of another officer and the registrari's clerk and a number of typists and uh, more junior clerks that had multiplied from the two or three that had been in that office uh, until uh, 1910, uh, uh, nine, in 1910 when he became registrari. And the registrari's office was in the, in the pit building. Um, it wasn't in the old schools because that's where the university library was. Uh, and uh, he had a close association with the, with the university press and the university printer uh, who of course maintained the records. That was what the, the registrari uh, had to do. He had to keep things sort of running smoothly to avoid, as Keynes put it, uh, grit getting into the machinery. And, uh, and huge lists were produced because of course it was not only maintaining the records of matriculations and degrees uh, but also, of course, um, uh, MAs of the university had the right to an extra to vote in parliamentary elections until 1950, and so the university printer had to keep a, a standing list of, of MAs and their addresses, mm -hmm. and so where you know election manifestos and so on could be posted out uh, at the time of general general elections, and that was the administrative uh, size of the university. As you get into the 30s, assistant registraries are, are, are appointed to want to become the secretary general of the faculties, uh, want to become the university uh, treasurer, uh, but again with minute staffs that, uh, and of course there was nothing even in the 1950s in the faculties and departments administratively what happened was that uh, the university lecturers were chairman and secretaries of faculty boards. Um, they ran things from their colleges uh, and uh, they might have the help of, of an administrative assistant, sort of a queen bee as we used to call them because they were all, they were all women. I mean, history had a very formidable lady, Miss Box, who had a cubbyhole in Green Street where she controlled the faculty of history from uh, into, the, into the 1960s. And again, it's incomprehensible to us now that the vice-chancellor uh, had uh, no real uh, authority uh, in the university. I mean, he, not in, in terms of policy making or strategy or managing uh, things. It was an office that rotated 
every other year between heads of house. And until um, uh, Professor Deere was, was vice chancellor, which was, I have to look that up, 1971 to 73, uh, there was no secretarial support provided for the vice chancellor. The vice chancellor's office consisted of two four drawer filing cabinets, uh, at a handset telephone, uh, a brass plate that said the vice chancellor, uh, and the uh, incredibly valuable and precious Essex Cup, uh, which moved from uh, college to college as the vice chancellor's office uh, sort of moved. Professor Deere himself uh, was Master of Trinity Hall and the head of one of the scientific departments and effectively uh, his secretary in the department served as, as his secretary. But by 1971-72 uh, it was becoming clear, although Deere himself did not wish to see this development, it was becoming clear that the vice chancellor might need uh, somewhere to, to hang, a, hang a gown in the old schools uh, and might need some secretarial help. So some very minimal uh, secretarial help was provided uh, from 1974. The, 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 uh, sorry to there is a story that Rosemary Murray, when she was vice chancellor, yeah. on a weekend she installed a lock and a door. Is that, is that right? That may well be true. You mean in the old schools? Yes. Yes. But yes. She didn't have an office. She had no, a corridor. That's right. Yes. Oh no, there's no there's no room for the vice chancellor in the old schools. They were all too important. The half dozen of them who ran the who really ran the university, the registrar right. and the secretary general and uh, and the treasurer. And two questions arising from that. One one of them is, um, does that mean that in that period that the the, the relative balance of power and influence. Uh, was laid with the colleges rather than the university? Well, no, because it was all much looser uh, than that. And I think the, uh, what became clear was that the, um, the council of the, the, the formal structure gave the council of the Senate and the general board and the financial board uh, real sort of influence and managerial responsibility. And so you had this triumvirate and they were until the, uh, the reforms of the 1990s, really, uh, they were regarded as, uh, as near equal, uh, as, as equal uh, bodies. They had emerged as, uh, had evolved to be equal bodies, each responsible for their own uh, share of running the university. So that the general board was much the most important body because the only role of the Council of the Senate, really, was to uh, vote every year to move 90% of the university's income to the general board office and then to fend off the borders uh, from the outside, really. Um, uh, and we, we adjusted that with the WAS syndicate probably to many people's regret that, uh, as it were, the silly irresponsible body of the university became technically the sovereign and the registrary as head of as the uh, administrative head of the council um, beca became the senior uh, academic administrative officer, and then you've got this complicated hierarchy uh, that 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 we now see. That was, of course, inevitable. This, uh, I mean, the more favourable way of putting it is that the huge growth um, in volume and complexity of the university required really significant skills to be able to, uh, to manage it and to, to make sure it was, it, it, was sort of, uh, it was sort of functioning properly and that you couldn't run uh, by a, a series of sort of informal agreements between sort of barons and just hoping everything would work out, uh, would work but, out right. But, but what, what, was, what led to the flows of money that, that forced that change? Was it research money from first I, science and engineering? Yes, I think that, that overwhelmingly uh, the, uh, what we don't appreciate adequately is that from the 1920s um, money begins to flow into the university. Uh, into on, the university, in, not, into, not the Into the university. Well, and because it's a complicated situation and into the colleges 
as well, because besides uh, the straightforward money that comes from the UGC for, uh, for teaching and for research, and then from uh, later as you go on the research councils for research funding and then other uh, semi-independent or, or independent trusts and, and philanthropic uh, bodies. You also have to remember that a huge change comes about uh, around the time of the late 1930s, early 1940s in terms of student funding so that by the time you get to 19, the 1950s uh, the, um, any student who gains admission to uh, the university uh, ha have their fees paid uh, by a public source and they also have either a state scholarship, which is a fully funded maintenance thing, or a means-tested maintenance allowance provided by their local education authority. And that allows uh, this uh, huge expansion in the number of undergraduates. Uh, it begins to pick up in the late 1930s, but really comes fully on stream in the 1950s and 1960s uh, when you know, people like you and me are able to come to Cambridge because we're paid for effectively. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and it, it, it also it, it symbolizes as well um, a sort of a change in, in character because uh, it was perfectly respectable well into the 1930s to come to Cambridge and not do very much. Uh, it, uh, the examinations were not important. Um, you, would, you would be taught in your, in your college. Uh, it was a very sort of personal exchange. Uh, the, there's a very good example of this. There's a very nice young man called Quentin Nelson who came up to Keyes in 1923. Uh, he, he sat the ordinary examination in English in 1927. He wrote a wonderful poem called The Co Fen Road, which is an elegiac attack on the, uh, on the philistinism of the destruction of Co Fen by the construction of Fen Causeway, which opened in 1926, in December 1926, which was Cambridge's first ring road, really, so that <laughs> traffic coming up the A10 didn't have to go through the town to link with okay. the Huntington Road. Um, and it destroyed Cofen uh, as, a, an, as a natural phenomenon. Um, uh, he, he, you know, he was perfectly hardworking. He became a, a wonderful priest in, in life and did great things. Uh, but he just did the ordinary degree, which meant that he didn't have to do any exams at all until the end of his time and the exams he had to do at the end were pretty trivial. Um, but that he had sat with his tutor, uh, uh, you know, his, uh, his teachers in his college, uh, reading English and he was very literate and okay. very well read. So, so that sort of person came up and I, I can recall, but I, and I've tried to find out where I saw this, but um, so I might be wrong, but I have a feeling that when I applied, in the summer of 1960, so I've been around since October 61, uh, when I applied to Trinity, there were um, messages in the admissions brochure that said an, an, a number of colleges no longer admit students for the ordinary degree. So there was a sense in which um, uh, uh, a lot, certainly through the 30s, but the chopper's beginning to come down. People are beginning to say, or the dons are beginning to say, if you come to Cambridge, you have to be interested in the subject and you have to work at it and you have to do, do an honours degree. Um, it's, it's sort of revealing that the Marquis of Zetland, um, who, uh, who was at Trinity in the 1890s, um, and who then had a very distinguished career. He was governor of Bengal and then secretary of state for India, and, and he was a great um, literary figure, fellow of the British Academy, and so on. In his, um, in his rather charming autobiography in the middle 1950s, he sort of thinks it was really 
wrong of him to be at Trinity for uh, a couple of years in the 1790s and doing nothing but going to the pit club and, and, and hunting and going to the new market and, and all of these things. And it, it was clearly, you, you didn't really, it, it was a sort of a finishing school um, uh, in a way of keeping sort of boisterous adolescent young men off the streets at a critical stage in their lives when they could do damage if they were on the streets. So, so, so somebody somebody characterised it, I mean, maybe it's a caricature of that, 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 in that in the period up to, say, the late the 40s, mm. that, that Cambridge was essentially a liberal arts school yeah. with, with some brilliant bits of that's, scientific that's work. Right. Yeah. That, yes, that? I think that's a very, uh, that's a very fair way um, of, of putting it. And, and of course, uh, again, if one's looking at, at, at the qualitative shifts that take place, um, no one puts it uh, more brilliantly or more uh, concisely than Isaiah Berlin in, in Oxford, because uh, he spends the war uh, in, uh, in the United States, uh, in, the, in the British Embassy. He's a, he's a huge sort of networker uh, and uh, and he's really interested in his subject, but particularly because um, he starts out as some sort of philosopher and then he thinks he wants to change his subject. But the thing that he learns about uh, his American experience and, and that then fits with much more general uh, cultural currents in this country in the, in the 50s and 60s is that he's, he sees that... Um, the great universities, which are the American universities, have their reputation because they have developed graduate studies and they are leaders in research. And that Oxford and Cambridge uh, in particular, who are these sort of old sort of uh, liberal arts places um, uh, and very laid back about that or very committed to just the BA uh, operation, are in serious danger of withering away if they do not gear up for research and for graduate uh, and for graduate uh, 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 study, and he sees this as a as a huge problem. Um, of course, it is a huge problem in Oxford because uh, they're very different over there from, uh, from, from over here where at least we've got a lot of brutal scientists who, who are already getting in charge of, of, uh, of uh, getting hold of the, of the university. But um, he sees that, that developments in France and Germany as well as in the United States uh, threaten to, to leave not just uh, Oxford and Cambridge uh, behind, but the whole country behind, and that of course had had that sort of philosophy is is emerging in things like the Robbins report, saying that there must be a great expansion of and the Robbins of, report is early early nineteen sixties yeah, yeah. Uh, of of, uh, of of university activity, and then there's this interesting sort of tussle about research um, and about graduate uh, studies. I mean, graduate studies. Or graduate research students go from, you know, uh, a, a few dozen in the interwar years to uh, to already heading towards um, uh, some hundreds in the in the post-war period. But that's still very small. And when I started uh, my PhD in 1964, there were only about a thousand research students mm. in Cambridge, uh, and we were virtually all Cambridge graduates. Um, uh, and now, you know, we're at six and a half, seven thousand graduate students uh, in Cambridge, and hardly any of them are Cambridge graduates, uh, which again is, a, is an interesting sort of commentary on, on, on the so, change of things. So, so, um, so when, when, I mean, thinking back, what, is there a way of identifying when the change happened? I mean, for example, in 1953, Watson and Crick mm -hmm. uh, crack the, the, mm -hmm. the structure of the DNA mm -hmm. molecule, and that means that th there is going to be a molecular biology laboratory here, mm -hmm. and it's going to be a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, but something happened in the 50s, mm -hmm. um, and my impression is that the university didn't, didn't have a plan at that point for anything like what happened. Is that oh, right? it, it, it has a plan. It certainly has a plan. It feels it's done enough and it's not going to do any more. Okay. Uh, so, so, I mean, this is really interesting because um, 
again, if, you, if, you, if one just looks at the sort of the science side of things, which is the important dynamic side, um, you know, you, you've, got, uh, you, you've got the Duke of Devonshire uh, putting up money for the Cavendish to start with. Um, you have private fundraising by the university for the engineering laboratory, which is in Free School Lane and, and, and so on. Uh, and uh, you have some sort of development. Uh, you, you have Trinity putting money into, uh, into research posts. St. John's would have done more had they not gone bust or had not had financial problems at the end of the 19th century. So there is an urge to do more on the, on the research side. And you get uh, the two world wars are, are sort of critical in, um, in pushing this agenda uh, uh, forward. In the Second World War, uh, in, uh, even, even more so than the first, really. Uh, and a lot of the new money coming into the university is going into developing the science curriculum and developing mm -hmm. science and engineering and technological uh, uh, re research. And Cambridge gets to be very good at some of those subjects. But uh, interestingly, in, 19, um, in 1956, uh, the Regent House uh, agrees with a general board report that enough is enough and the university cannot uh, go on. It, exp it, it, it proposed that expansion of the university uh, should, should be considerably reduced. It, in order to maintain the compactness of Cambridge and its collegiate character, that no new technological study should be introduced and that, and that new research development should be made in close connection with the work of the teaching uh, departments. And they did this because they felt that um, they'd already done their bit. I mean, in the post-war period, they'd uh, done the chemical laboratory and the veterinary school and the, uh, and the engineering laboratory on, at, the end of, uh, at the end of Fen Causeway. Uh, and they had, uh, you know, all the undergraduate pressures had been great and the colleges just couldn't take it any, any, anymore. Um, and so uh, the university's official position was uh, in 1956, we're not going to expand anymore. And that, of course, married with the Cambridge local plan, which the government had approved, that, uh, that the, ca the population of Cambridge would be stabilised, uh, that there would be no further growth of the city, and that there would be no, uh, no new industries would be allowed to settle uh, in, in this area. So it's very heartening that all the best laid plans of <laughs> men and mice <laughs> go astray. And how, how did it happen? So I, I think that, of course, what, it, what happens is that you have this concentration in, in, in Cambridge and, and in the town of, of exciting, interesting, highly intelligent, strongly motivated people who, uh, who seek to uh, uh, get their own way and to dismantle barriers as, uh, that, that, are, that are sort of put in their, uh, put in their way. And I think it, it, it is of significance that in Cambridge the, um, the scientific departments, um, not all of them, but a lot of them begin to be on a roll and they are recruiting research students and they are developing um, their undergraduate syllabus to take account of the absolute mass of new information and new research that is coming up mm. in the subject. Uh, in the 1950s. And because this is sort of incremental, I mean, in, uh, although people uh, squeal because there are numerous sort of pressure points uh, in, in the place as a result, uh, as, as a result of this, it, it is an evolution. So it, it is a sort of, um, it, there is a sort of a dynamism there. And, and, and it's, it's I, I think it's probably quite critical that uh, a generation of, of leading scientists uh, come to Cambridge. Um, it's revealing, I think, that a lot of the key people 
come from outside, from Manchester, from Bristol, from, from London, uh, I think because they somehow feel uh, the quality of life in Cambridge is better than, uh, than in some of these other places. Not that they're deprived of resources in other places. I mean, Sir Neville Mott has a wonderful laboratory in Bristol that is uh, funded by the, the cigarette family, the Wills uh, family. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and others come from uh, very well provided uh, facilities, but they come to, uh, to, to Cambridge, and some of them go to Oxford uh, a, 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 as well. And, and I think it's, they are sort of attracted by the lifestyle. And uh, a key thing is they decide they're going to work together. Uh, and in Cambridge, one can illustrate this by saying that you know, the natural sciences tripos, which is a very peculiar beast, um, is, uh, poses horrendous administrative problems. There's, uh, how do you keep adding new knowledge Modules. into the science? How do you decide um, you know, what an appropriate educational mix is? And then you get to very basic things like um, if you can have all these dozens of options in natural sciences part one, how do you timetable the lectures and the laboratory work and the uh, examination schedule and, 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 and so on. So um, uh, the, what happens within the general board office uh, is, the, is an absolutely key figure is, is Ian Nicholl who, uh, who gets together a, a natural sciences tripos committee which is where the uh, dons and the different subjects get together to put together the tripos and then the heads of departments begin I think to meet um, informally and they do trade-offs with each other who's going to get the new jobs who's going to make the bids for new resources for their laboratories and so uh, across a major part of the university where there is relatively uh, more funding than in the uh, arts and humanities um, you have the, the beginnings of a, of a structure of, uh, of cooperation. And of course, they, as Cornford had pointed out you know, in 1908, the scientists, are, they're just the guys who want all the money. And they know how they're going to get it, you see, whereas we poor uh, arts and humanities people are just sort of nowhere because we don't like to cooperate. You know, we are all in our colleges separately. The English faculty did not want a new building on the Sidgwick site in the, 19, in the 1950s and 1960s. They regretted it when you know, they had to have a cut down version much later than one. They, but English was not that sort of subject. You didn't meet your colleagues. You, you, know, you might have met them collectively sort of once a year uh, at a, some annual faculty meeting, but the university and the general board was not to interfere in the subject. Um, the historians were cannier about it, but, uh, but other, other faculties in the arts and the social sciences um, were always at a disadvantage because um, they just didn't, they just hadn't developed this this whole business of, uh, of trade-offs, really, and of, uh, so they were picked off sort of singly. Okay, so, so then you have, so, so we have this, this period then when, f first of all, the, the, the science and the, the, the non-humanities side of the university yeah. is getting its act together. Yeah. Um, laboratories are growing, mm -hmm. like molecular biology mm -hmm. and others. They're attracting, laboratories need graduate mm -hmm. students, full stop. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there's pressure building. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the established colleges don't like that much, is that right? Well, it's, a real, it's, it's outside of their uh, area of, of competence. I mean, w what they don't like um, by the time you get into the 1950s is the fact that there are um, a lot of university officers, uh, both teaching officers and now a growing number of support officers, who have no college connection. And the, the, there is a pressure point there of people saying it, that is just wrong. It is, uh, it's 
unacceptable for people to be uh, living and working in Cambridge and not have uh, a, a, college. a college membership or, or really not having a college fellowship because college fellowship carries with it so much prestige and so much social cachet uh, as well as in some cases additional emoluments uh, that, you know, that he carried the, the, the stipend. Um, and, and that is why, I mean, you, by the time you get to the, the early 1960s, all sorts of people are proposing all sorts of ways of, of dealing with that. And, and of course, unlike the undergraduates who are admitted by the colleges, the graduate students are admitted by the Board of Graduate Studies, mm -hmm. by the university and by <coughs> the departments, but they can't actually study in Cambridge until they're also admitted by a college. So if you get colleges not really being willing to admit graduate students and colleges saying um, our high table isn't big enough to have any more fellows, uh, then a great deal of discontent uh, begins, to, uh, begins to emerge um, in, in quite a sort of uh, a, a serious way. And what gives then? What, what happens? Well, next? What, what sort of gives is that uh, the university itself recognizes that there's um, a, a really quite uh, a furious debate goes on um, uh, through the nineteen through the late nineteen fifties and uh, and into the nineteen sixties uh, on this issue: should Cambridge grow or not? And uh, what we know now, of course, is that those who say it, it should grow are the ones who come out on, on top. But yep. they, they come out on top um, after a number of very fierce, uh, fierce skirmishes. Um, but what, what I think is, is important for us, particularly in this college, to, uh, to see is that there are a number of sort of enterprising and creative solutions offered. None of them work wholly and none of them work separately and they all um, make a distinctive contribution to the, uh, the ongoing, um, uh, the, the ongoing uh, debate. But uh, very early in, in, in the 1960s there's a little club uh, gets established, the, um, uh, the 1960s group, who start to pressure the university to provide uh, social facilities for those who do not have colleges. So what they want um, in, the, in the terms of their sort of various manifestos and fly sheets is they want a proper faculty club. They, they know they can't have something like Harvard, but uh, at least Nottingham, Nottingham has a serious faculty club where you can entertain colleagues and get a decent meal and, and, and so on. And, and have a common room for you to, uh, uh, and things like that. Um, and uh, in, uh, in, in Corpus uh, Christi College, um, Michael McCrum, who's then the senior tutor, and, and one or two others who, the, the people are very edgy because a college like Corpus is tiny, but it has a relatively large endowment. And of course, always in Cambridge, envy drives people, you know. The rich colleges should be dispossessed of their wealth unless yeah, they use no, it responsibly. So, so there's, um, yeah. uh, there's a sense in which these colleges then start to come up with proposals. So, uh, so, so, so Corpus has this garden out here, this Leckhampton House garden, and they decide, well, one of the things they could do perhaps is to have a... Uh, a sort of a graduate house out in Leckhampton and uh, perhaps half a dozen uh, fellows who won't be proper fellows, they'll be Leckhampton fellows uh, of the college. And of course they're a mile from <laughs> the, uh, unit, the, the main site. Uh, and, uh, and, and so that gets, uh, that gets underway. Um, the, the wonderful story about the founding of, of Darwin is that uh, again in the early 1960s, the Department um, of Education, as it then is, um, uh, begins to retreat under Treasury pressure from this blanket, we will pay all fees for all students. 
and they, be, they start to have an annual meeting with the bursars of Oxford and Cambridge colleges about the level of college fees. College fees are all set differently. Each college charges differently. <laughs> and it's a, uh, again, a very different situation from, from now. Um, and and the, the mandarins, of course, in, 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 the, in, in London, the civil servants, they're all Oxbridge graduates. So um, there's no serious knife taken, but uh, they're beginning to wave there's it. There's pressure. They're beginning to wave it about because they, so, they are under so much pressure, both economic and, uh, and, and, and political. And the story is that, of course, the Cambridge negotiating team consists of John Bradfield, uh, the, uh, the, the bursar of Trinity, and Chris Johnson, the bursar of St. John's, and the then bursar of, of Keys. And um, the train service is rackety, and uh, they're, they're stranded uh, one day. John Bradfield tells his story, coming back from their negotiations with, um, with the government uh, outside of Cambridge. And they get to talking about the terrible pressures those three colleges are coming under to do something for fellows, to admit more graduate students, or to face the prospect of uh, having some of their endowment removed by one way or another. And so they come up with this very clever idea, let's set up a new college. And it's going to be a college for uh, research people and it's going to be a college for graduate students, so we can do it very cheaply. We'll find a property. Um, the, dons won't, the dons won't need rooms because they're not going to teach. Um, the university is, is moving reluctantly to create some sort of faculty club, which is that monstrous university centre. So uh, if we find somewhere near the university centre, uh, the new we college need won't, dining hall. won't need a dining hall because they can go over there for their lunch and, and, and dinner and so on. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we, we will get enormous credit uh, for, for doing this bold and noble thing. And, and they do that uh, to their enormous credit um, uh, on, you know, £15,000 a year uh, <laughs> for a promise of 10 years. Uh, so, um, uh, and that, of course, is the model mm. that the university uh, then follows because it's clear that the Lecampton Initiative, uh, Clare is another college that... Uh, is queasy about its endowment via via its commitment, and they decide, uh, again under Ashby's influence, very nobly that they will found a new college. But that is going to um, that's going to have a slightly different mission because uh, Richard Eden, um, uh, a physicist uh, with lots of American experience, says the real need in Cambridge is to be able to treat. Uh, senior visitors nicely. So what we want is a sort of a bijou all cells college that will only be doing research and will have a lot of visitors um, and, and will have a, a, a small permanent fellowship, as it were, of people who are not engaged in the teaching of undergraduates by and large. And that too is the Darwin mm. model. Um, uh, and so, uh, so that, is, that is happening. Um, uh, and uh, the, the university um, uh, sees that this is not going to be enough and as part of this whole package, so Leckhampton, Clare Hall, uh, Darwin, um, uh, the university centre, um, then uh, we'll have another college, we'll have university, uh, we'll have university college and we will follow the, um, uh, the Trinity Keys St. John's model. model. Um, we have this house here which had been uh, occupied by Newhall uh, and reverting to the, un owned by the university and reverting to the university um, and we'll set up a board of trustees and, and there we go. So, uh, so the, 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 the context uh, uh, really is this um, is this enormous growth of, of Cambridge, which of course just goes faster and faster after the 1960s, um, and particular, uh, in particular, this 
um, this really interesting uh, shift of, of emphasis from, um, from undergraduates to graduate studies and to research uh, 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 students. But I think it's, it's, it's really vital to see that that all fits, that's all part uh, as well of a much larger uh, uh, shift in, 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 in British uh, society because, uh, because it is constantly being matched by developments on the outside, by industrial change, by technological change, by the interest of various companies to invest in the pure research in the universities and then to carry it off and, and apply it. And uh, in, the, in the Cambridge region, of course, this comes to fruition um, uh, from the 1960s onwards. N Neville Mott, who, uh, who is, is um, uh, uh, head of the Cavendish, writes a report um, in 1969, which the General Board endorses, which says very simply, um, we are not going to thrive unless we make our number with business and industry <coughs> and with the local society uh, and we ought to, uh, to be sure that we establish collaborations and, and look outwards on, uh, on all of that and see that uh, the role of the university is of course essentially you know, discovery, uh, excellence in teaching, uh, finding new knowledge, trying to understand it, but it goes beyond that. It goes beyond that into applying it or seeing that it gets, gets applied and feeds into the, uh, the economic development of the, uh, of, of the advanced technological society in, in which we now live and benefit from. So um, all around Cambridge you get uh, enterprising dons setting up companies but also enterprising entrepreneurs coming to, mm. uh, to benefit from the research that the university is doing and, the, and there are lots of sort of crossovers and things. And uh, again I think it's, it's important to recognise that this works so well in the Cambridge area it works well in Oxford, it works well in Manchester, it looks as though it's going to work really well in London um, uh, now, uh, but it, it works well because it is not managed. Mm. One has a, um, one has a, w one establishes a context and an environment in which people can, can do things. I think Jeremy Sanders in the recent interview with The Economist um, put it very nicely when he said that when he was uh, head of chemistry, uh, what he sought to do was appoint a whole lot of people much cleverer than himself and then let them get on with whatever it was they wanted to do. Now, um, so, so this is a, it's a sort of, um, uh, it's, a, it's a sort of culture of, uh, of acceptable anarchy, really, mm. uh, in, in which um, you, you contrive to allow sort of uh, intelligent people to give vent to their, creativ their creativity. You are allowing them to decide um, what, is, what are the most interesting or important questions and then you, you're going to hope that uh, there's a certain serendipity in all of this, I mean, you would hope that they would, that that what comes out of this will will just, just to pick up on the serendipity point for a minute. I mean, there's, um, and it it, it plays into mm -hmm. the, the the picture you've just been painting, which, which is, um, it's John Bradfield's role in this, mm -hmm. the 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 first person mm -hmm. of Trinity. Um, I mean, the, the story, as I have been told it, is that Trinity has this land on the outskirts of the town, mm -hmm. and. From the bursar's point of view, it's really bad news because mm -hmm. it's owned as farmland mm -hmm. and he gets minuscule rents from mm -hmm. it. And the city council is not going to entertain any notion mm -hmm. of development. Mm -hmm. he, can't, he can't use that land mm -hmm. for any, any really valuable mm -hmm. purpose. And then Bradfield finds himself in, in Stanford and he sees what Stanford is starting to do with those orchards and things mm -hmm. it owns in Palo Alto. 
the beginnings of what we now mm. call Silicon Valley. And he comes back and he, he spins the city mm. council with a really good yarn, mm. uh, which is that, you know, and, and, and from that comes the Cambridge Science Park. And, yeah. and not incidentally, a number of acres that yielded almost no rent yes. suddenly become <laughs> extremely valuable. Yeah. Uh, is that the kind of, is that? Yes, I mean, I, that is precisely the sort of development uh, that, that, uh, that, 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 that takes place. Um, uh, and, and it does connect um, a whole lot of, uh, or rather it sort of it reconnects, as it were, important elements of the local economy uh, with the university and, and the colleges. And of course this is, this is normally quite invisible, that one doesn't really sort of notice that. You, one's beginning to see it more explicitly now because people, because the, everything is, is so, it's so sort of huge and it's difficult to navigate through the complexity. You begin to have thing, uh, things like on, on the West Cambridge site, there is now you know, the Hauser Forum where, where uh, a deliberate and explicit effort is made to connect um, entrepreneurs and business and the local society with the work that's going on um, uh, in, in, in the university. When, when you, uh, I mean, an interesting thought experiment is, is to imagine somebody who had known Cambridge well in 1950 mm -hmm. and then have them come back. Now, mm -hmm. when, when, with my press fellows, I, the press fellows that come here every year, um, I was dismayed to learn after a while that they think of Cambridge as being those picturesque ruins mm -hmm. in the middle mm -hmm. of the town. Um, and eventually I thought I'd better do something about this, so I took them on it on a tour. Mm -hmm. I put them into the car and I drove them around the West Cambridge site. And then I showed them North West Cambridge, what's happening there. Mm -hmm. And then I took them to the Biosciences campus mm -hmm. in Addenbrooke's and then further out to the Genome campus. Mm -hmm. And they were completely blown, blown away mm -hmm. because they had no image mm -hmm. of Cambridge. Mm -hmm. It's been like that. Mm -hmm. And that would be true of anybody coming mm -hmm. from the 1950s. Mm -hmm. it's, it's now, Is it's it? a completely different place. Yes, one's, uh, one's assumptions about uh, Cambridge, the place, the university town, um, uh, have to change. Uh, I, you, uh, um, a Andrew Reid uh, let me have some very interesting figures and, and maps. You know, the, the West Cambridge site alone is bigger than the traditional centre of, of Cambridge and its colleges, which is all there was in the 19... In, in the 1950s, and um, you know, it, it is shocking now for those of us who came up in 1961 to find that the hospital is not opposite St Catherine's. Mm -hmm. That's where the Judge Business School is, but it's yeah. down mm -hmm. there, uh, and now it's the bio, uh, this huge sort of biomedical campus. Um, there's a there's a very, if you'll indulge me, there's a very interesting sort of. Um, and I think uh, quite important anecdote, but I, a, a, a bit of anecdotal history, but I haven't quite sort of placed it sort of properly uh, yet. Um, uh, that again is another way of coming at this issue. You know that, that uh, one of Cambridge's major industries now is the Marshall uh, Aerospace and Engineering uh, uh, industry, which is um, you know, a multi-billion pound uh, operation and of enormous importance and is still um, owned by uh, the family that set it up. Now the origins of that are very straightforward. Um, uh, David Marshall, born in 1873, um, by the time he's 14 is a kitchen boy in Trinity. And uh, he's obviously quite shrewd and he makes friends with um, some of the younger uh, fellows, uh, his exact contemporary in particular, the physiologist uh, Walter Morley Fletcher. And by the time these two are uh, uh, in their late twenties, Morley Fletcher um, uh, is faced with serious problems about running the pit club, which is an undergraduate club, uh, and of course, since it deals with catering and all the corruption that goes on in catering, um, uh, it's in serious financial difficulty. 
And so Walter Morley Fletcher uh, goes to, to David Morgan, who has worked his way up to being sort of under Butler uh, in Trinity, uh, and says, would you like to run the pit club? And, uh, and David Marshall does. He accepts this challenge. Um, and uh, he turns it round financially. He turns it round in very imaginative ways. Um, he starts to have an annual pit club ball that's a real money spinner. But on a regular basis, it's boxes of breakfasts out to the young gentlemen in their lodgings in the centre of, in the centre of town. And he, he remodels the interior of the club. And come 1909, he spots, having visited uh, Paris earlier, he spots that there's a market for not just the young gentlemen, but the more daring fellows uh, to be driven around in these newfangled motor cars. So he sets up a chauffeur business mm. with two or three cars in 1909. Uh, and then come, and that of course grows beyond belief. Uh, he has a very good war because his, his, uh, his Trinity connections and various other Quaker connections <coughs> that he comes in touch with give him the responsibility to provision the Woolwich Arsenal during the war where uh, the need to feed um, uh, 30,000 workers uh, becomes very pressing in the closing years of the war. Um, he also sees at the end of the war that people are interested in aeroplanes and there's a lot of uh, stray aeroplanes lying around going for nothing, you know, or next to nothing. And so with enthusiastic dons like, you know, the mad reverend uh, uh, F.A. Simpson, who's very keen on all this newfangled stuff and and the aesthetes who think it's wonderful to be able to fly from Cambridge to Paris for lunch. You know? <laughs> uh, uh, he he you know, builds a little airstrip and we go from there. And, and so, uh, but, but you see, that I think the importance of that story is that the, there is a connection there between entrepreneurship, the local community, uh, the university and the college's connections, and of course, the, uh, as Marshalls develops uh, into mm. what it becomes in the post-Second World War period, I mean, the, the huge, huge importance of, of the research, the technological research and engineering and, and so on, of, in which Cambridge plays um, mm. a, a, a major part. We could go on, but we won't. Right. Thank you very much, Gordon. Thank you for this. Thank you very much.